Hello, everybody. Hey, good evening. Welcome. Uh, if you're wondering, like everybody who comes into this space, no, we do not own this space uh, as a church, but my name is Tyler Goresline, and I get to serve as the lead pastor of this church community that meets here uh, on the regular. Uh, it's called A Seattle Church. Um, and so we're super, super glad to have you here um, to gather with us tonight. Um, I realized John Mark just walked out of the room, so that's that moment where you like start talking, and you're like, well, I hope he comes back. <laughs> um, if not, you got me, and I, 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 I'm, pre I'm, in, I'm ready. I was like, come on, Russell. Thank you, bro. Um, well, to give a little background and context, um, as folks continue to settle in, one, again, welcome to the space, the collective. It's a co-working space by day. Um, so if you need to climb in the hammock or go on the rock wall, uh, God be with you. I hope you survive. Um, likewise, important to know um, is that the restrooms are like back up this way behind. Don't feel like weird at all about getting up, go to the restroom. Um, it's just right back around there. I was also told to tell you from the Practicing the Way team that there are books for sale, um, signed books, uh, Practicing the Way by John Mark. If you heard, that's what you're here for. They're right over there. Uh, if you want to buy them for friends and family, um, you can do that after our time. But to just give a quick intro that needs no intro, um, I have fortunately got to build a bit of a friendship with John Mark over the years, and it started a long time ago before he even knew who I was, and I would go to this college ministry event in Beaverton, Oregon, called The Way. Uh, if anybody knows The Way, yeah, I love that. Look at that. Long timers. And I was a student up here at Seattle Pacific. My family's from the Portland area, and I'd come home, and I'd go and this big garage and just enjoy this great Bible teaching, right? That was the whole thing. Like, I got to learn about the scriptures. I was new to my faith, and I just deeply, deeply wanted to learn from this guy named John Mark Comer. And as the years passed, and um, we got to plant a church in the city, you know, the question you're always asking is, how is discipleship or apprenticeship, how is it even possible? Like, how can you shape and experience the transformation that you're believing for in the context of a church? And graciously, as part of a network of pastors um, that were gathering with John Mark and a variety of his friends, um, I've gotten to learn more and more about how this stuff that we're talking about tonight, that practicing the way, is not just lived in John Mark's life, uh, which is the most beautiful and telling thing for me, that he's not just giving us great information, but he's seeking to live transformation. But also that um, these things can really work and help us to grow and thrive in our relationship and our intimacy with Jesus as we fall forward and in our local church communities, which I'm just so hopeful that practicing the way and the ministry of John Mark Comer and others is really continuing to bless your churches um, in and out. And so please let us know any ways that we can be of support or encouragement to you tonight. But without further ado, would you guys welcome up John Mark Comer? Thanks, mate. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Did I, what do you call it? This Is it the Seattle freeze? Is this what it's called? I just got a little taste right there, you know? No, I'm just kidding. You're nice, right? Yeah, no. It's great to be with you. Thank you so much for coming. It is my honor to be with you and hope to meet as many of you as possible before the night is done. And again, just really, really grateful to be with you. Um, I do want to add a little bit of value to your life in theory and not waste your time. So I thought I would talk a little bit. That's kind of what I do to a fault. And then uh, the plan is to open it up for a lot of questions and keep Tonight, mostly something that you could not get on a podcast. You had to be there for better or for worse. I don't know. And we have a little fun award. Don't let me forget this. My 15-year-old son is traveling with me. Moses is up there in the netting. <laughs> Peace out, bro. He, that's leaving me connecting with Gen Z. See that? That was amazing. Just, um, <laughs> he's just laughing at me. <laughs> he's getting to that age where he's just starting to mock his dad. It's so bad. I'd be like, how do you handle like, you know, be being well known? I'm like, easy. I just come home and I have a family. It's very grounding. Trust me, it's very grounding. But he is an amazing artist. And so he's drawing in one of the books, uh, one of my favorite fourth century images of Christ. And we'll pass that out for free. So one of you gets a special art edition of Practicing the Way. Don't let me forget, Moto. Okay? Don't let me forget. Don't let me forget. Okay. There it is again. 
the Seattle freeze. It's killing me. It's like I'm in England or something. This is your life. I know how to pray for you, Tyler. They're so nice, but are they? I don't know. No, it's great to be with you. Every morning, I, like I'm sure many of you in the room, I get up early and uh, if I can in time to watch the sunrise, which in the Pacific Northwest is quite easy. It's at like noon. So um, it's a bit harder where I live now in Southern California. But I get up to watch the sunrise and I make myself a small cup of coffee and I have this little quiet corner in my house where I go to pray. And I'm guessing many of you have some kind of daily prayer rhythm that is in your life as well. And, uh, but I'm guessing that one way I'm a little bit unlike you is I pray in front of this object here. I think we have a, an iPhone photograph of, nope, not Yinka. She's lovely though. <laughs> that would be really weird. Uh, um, I pray in front of this, which is also weird, but morally acceptable. Um, this is uh, an odd practice, but I got this idea from the monastic tradition where it has long been common practice to pray facing a skull in a monastic center, like a real one. This is not real. I just need to go on record saying this is not a real, this is from Etsy, not from a local graveyard. I did have about a four day ethical quagmire when my brother-in-law, who does quite a bit of work in Mexico, um, I was chatting about the skull as like originally being uh, an artistic motif from ancient Christian monasteries and all of this stuff that we'll get into. And he said, well, you know, I, I know where I can get you one. And he's like, I know, he, he wasn't joking. He's like, I know a market in Mexico City. And if you go to the back stall and you kind of keep it on the DL, they'll take you behind a tent flap into a back room and I can get you one. And I thought about it for several days. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I would be getting it to pray, but it would, it's, I doubt that's legal. I don't know if that's legal. And I thought in the day and age of cancel culture, that would be, if you're gonna go down, that would be a pretty good thing to go down for. Like smuggling skull over the border to pray. That's like, if you're gonna go out, there are worse things to go out for, you know? This is not real, but in the monastic tradition, it's very common, in all seriousness, to pray facing a skull. In their case, a real one from a previous denizen in the monastery. And this is all going back to the 6th century and St. Benedict of Nursa's Rule of St. Benedict, the founder of one of the oldest monastic orders in the world, one of the oldest rule of lifes in the world, where he said, day by day, remind yourself that you are going to die. And that sounds utterly horrific to our modern sensibilities. Like, who says that? But in context, it wasn't bleak or morbid uh, or masochistic in the least bit. It was Benedict's way of saying, life is a fleeting, precious gift that right now is passing through your fingers like oxygen through your lung cavity. Don't waste it on triviality. Don't waste your life. Don't blow it. Live for what matters in the scheme of eternity. And we live in a day and age where it has never been easier to waste your life. You can disappear into the black hole of your streaming platform of choice, or you can become in a city like Seattle a workaholic in pursuit of careerism or whatever it is, or just kind of eat and drink your way through the adult playground of a modern city. As the Catholic writer Ronald Rollheiser put it, we are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. The trick is we often don't realize this until it's far too late. David Brooks, the New York Times columnist, famously distinguished between resume virtues and eulogy virtues. I'm guessing many of you are familiar with this. Uh, resume virtues are what we talk about in our life. Hey, who are you? Tell me about you, who you are. Well, I work here and I've done this and here's my eulogy virtues are what other people talk about in our death, which it turns out is likely a very different list of things. It's the fabric of our character, who we did or did not become, the makeup of our closest interpersonal relationships. To day by day remind yourself that you are going to die is to live for your eulogy and not your resume. 
It's to live, to refuse to be sucked into the black hole of distraction in our age and to live for what really matters. I had a honestly just really profound moment that unexpectedly, you know, there's the intentional kind of rule of life, discipline kind of stuff that I do a lot of work on. And then there's all the serendipity or sovereignty, depending on your theological worldview. There's all the surprise moments of God in your everyday life that you don't plan and you don't order, but they, they impact you, they form you. And I had one deeply impactful moment, you know, maybe two years ago, through a string of coincidences, my family of origin, since before I was born, has been in relationship with a family of a very famous Christian preacher. I won't say who it is, but very kind of household name around the world preacher who died recently. And there was a public memorial. Welcome, guys. There was a public memorial. We're just going to try to pretend like you're not walking in and sit in the front row, but we're really happy you're here. We're really happy you're here. Um, there was a public memorial for, you know, all sorts of people, and then there was a private memorial for about 80 kind of family and friends. And I was invited, and, and the, the preacher who died was much older than me, and my dad was kind of grieving, but I was fine. I just went to be kind of a dutiful friend to his son that I'm still in good relationship with. And uh, so I kind of went just to be a good friend, sat in the back. It was two hours long, and it ravished my heart because two hours long, not a word was said about his preaching ministry. Not a passing aside about his books that he'd written, all sorts of... I mean, it was like he might as well have been anything. Plumber, barista, anything. You had no clue. It was just all stories about dad, grandpa... His gay grandson who doesn't know what he believes about God who got up and said, yeah, every, we go on vacation together every summer. And uh, he'd take a different grandkid out to breakfast every morning at 6 a.m. And he just asked me questions and he would never judge me and he'd always love me. And I'm still working it out, but I know that grandpa loved me. It was just stuff like that. And it messed me up because I walked out of there realizing I'm giving the vast majority of my energies so by the time my body is cold, nobody's going to care anymore. It's going to be done. Like the people that I am most invested in, they do not care about the book that hopefully is in your hands. They, my children will probably never read this book. Um, my wife's only about 50 pages in, and I'm not sure if she'll get past that. I don't know. And so, you know, all of this, the work that, the work that we do, and please, if, you've, if you're familiar with my theological rubric, I believe deeply in the theological significance of our work. It matters. It's an important thing, but it's not the most important thing. The philosopher Dallas Willard used to say, the main thing that God gets out of your life is the person you become. What an un-American statement. And all I would add to that is, and what a non-Seattle statement, right? All I would add to that is, and the people that we become that person with, the relationships that we are formed by and formed in and in turn form along the way. And this process of becoming a person, in particular becoming a person who is defined by love in the vision of Jesus, is what in the Christian way is called spiritual formation, which is kind of the heart and gist of the book. And all spiritual formation is, is the process by which our spirit, which is just New Testament language for our inner woman or inner man, your inner self, is formed into a particular shape or what we would call a character. And the first thing that you need to understand about spiritual formation is that spiritual formation is not a Christian thing or even a religious thing. You don't need to be a disciple of Jesus. It is just a human thing. To be human is to have a spirit, to have this part of you that does not show up under a microscope in a laboratory, yet is the most important part of who you are, this fulcrum, this thing that scientists still scratch their head and cannot figure out what we would call the will, the volitional nature of the human being. We can't, we can't locate it, but yet it's the most real thing about you. To be human is to have a spirit and to be formed, to grow, to mature, to change over time. What happens when you, know, you run into somebody that you've not seen in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, and if you spend time around them, if you say to them, oh, John, you've not changed one bit, 
That is never a compliment. <laughs> never. That is always code for something has gone wrong in your development. You've stunted, you've stalled out. There's this deep, incohate knowledge in our gut that we are designed to grow and mature and evolve and become more, in a sense, than who we are. The question is not to be formed. And the question is not, are we being formed? It's who or what are we being formed into? I occasionally hear people say that they are, because of the kind of work I do in the field I'm kind of in, or involved in, I occasionally have people say to me that they are getting into spiritual formation, by which they normally mean they are reading books by introverts <laughs> like myself <laughs> and beginning to practice uh, spiritual disciplines <laughs> that are a bit more contemplative in nature like Sabbath or solitude or Lectio Divina, mm -hmm. and often that they are, in millennial speak, you know, in the work of therapy and beginning to explore kind of their past and their family and their shadow side. And that's not to make light of that. That, that little trifecta, that's kind of, that's my lane. I am for that a thousand percent. But there is a kind of ornery older brother like part of me that just wants to say, listen, you have been into spiritual formation since before you came out of your mother's womb. Before you took your first breath, you have been by forces outside of you and inside of you being formed. Spiritual formation begins in utero and continues until the last day of our life. Mother, Peri Mother Teresa was a product of spiritual formation. So was Genghis Khan. Queen Elizabeth was spiritually formed. Nelson Mandela was really into spiritual formation. Former President Donald Trump is obsessed with spiritual formation. In fact, people like him, you can often track it most visibly because they're public figures. I just was watching Home Alone Escape in New York over Christmas. He makes an appearance. He was much happier pre-Twitter him was just, he's been formed. He has changed. He has evolved over time. And I don't even mean that as a judgment statement, certainly not as a political statement, just all human beings, every single human being you have ever known has been formed over a long period of time through a complex alchemy of genetic inheritance, family patterns, childhood wounds, epigenetic code, education, lack of education, habits, attitudes, decisions, non-decisions, success, failure, relationships, environments, moving to Seattle, getting this job, losing this job, marriage, divorce, you name it, and more. We have been formed. We are being formed right now as we speak and we will be formed in the days to come. Spiritual formation is not optional. The problem that a lot of us face as followers of Jesus, of a vested interest in the telos, the end goal, where we go, who we become, is that most of our formation is unintentional. Have you ever known anyone whose life has ended in disaster? I've known lots of people like that. Have you ever met somebody who has been through a divorce, who's become estranged from their kids, who's become bitter? Have you ever met somebody so laced with anger and resentment, and normally you can't see till about their 50s, that their face begins to get creases in it that never go away and a permanent scowl begins to be etched into their face? Have you ever met people who are so bent under the weight of wounding or shame that their shoulders begin to round and curve in and their neck goes down and they begin to almost permanently slouch and cower? I have an 18-year-old son, senior in high school, not that one, with his headphones on, ignoring me right now. I have an 18-year-old son, senior in high school, He's just getting asked all the time right now that horrible question if you're an 18-year-old and perfectly reasonable question if you're a 43-year-old. What do you want to do with your life? And what are you doing next? And he doesn't quite know yet. He's working on that. And uh, I have never met an 18-year-old who answered, well, what I would love to do is just become increasingly bitter year over year and just become an incredibly cynical and resentful person who just sees the world with the most negative slant possible. I would love to fall in love and commit my life to somebody, and then I, I would love to break that vow horribly and ruin their life and mine through heartache. 
I'd love to give 18 years of my life slaving away to raise a child only to grow estranged or separated from them in adulthood. I would love to just become so deeply anxious and controlling that nobody wants to be around me because I'm constantly trying to control my environment in order to calm my anxiety. Never had an 18-year-old say that to me, but I know lots of people my age and older who, of whom that is true. My point there is, is a bit sobering, but nobody sets out to be a failure. Nobody sets out to have heartache, visit their life, and regret. And yet it happens, and it happens all the time. Simply by just waking up in the morning, walking out into a city like Seattle, and living a normal life. And I don't say that to scare anyone, certainly not to shame anyone. Gosh, as I enter midlife, I'm more aware of the, the weak point in the shadow of my person than I've ever been in my whole life. I say it to say, Christ-likeness, if you take the teachings of Jesus seriously, I mean, you cannot read the Sermon on the Mount and have not have Jesus raise the horizon of possibility over your future and over the kind of person you become. One of the great dangers of living in cities is most people are young. And uh, one of the great gifts of being around elderly people is most elderly people are either horrible, I mean, let's just be honest, because they've been being formed in the wrong direction for like 80 years and it is really ugly, or they tend to be the most joyful, selfless, kind. I got a nerd out on you. I got a nerd out on you. If you've ever listened to my teaching, you know that my intellectual father is the philosopher Dallas Willard, deeply imprinted on my life. So just through a random coincidence, we have moved to LA up to Topanga Canyon and we live just about 20 minutes from his home. And his widow Jane there, who's 90 years old, we have a relationship and we've just been visiting her and spending some time with her. And uh, she texted my wife a couple hours ago. And she said, I heard John Mark is on the road and doing some speaking and I just want you to know I'm praying for him like I used to pray for Dallas when he went out. I thought. And my wife is like, the widow of your intellectual father is praying for you. I'm like, tonight's going to be good. It's going to be, if you, don't, if you don't think this is very helpful, this is me on the prayers of Jane Willer, all right? So if this, if this is not up to par, it's normally just not even close, trust me. But if you get to the chance to be around somebody like that, we got to introduce her a few weeks ago to Chipotle, very randomly, we were at this thing. <laughs> And we had to get, it was late, we needed to get some food, and our house is under renovation, so we just took her to Chipotle with our family. She had the chips and queso. She emailed me the next day thanking me for introducing her to the chips and queso at Chipotle. And I thought, Dr. Willard, we honor your name and your legacy. Caring for blessing you. It was such an honor. That is a long roundabout way of saying the danger of being in a city is you often don't get time around people like that. But if you ever get the privilege of being around a saint, whether they have that title or not, somebody that has been on the journey of formation longer than you've been alive, and imperfect as they are and flawed as we all are, we go to our grave with unhealed parts of our soul, but formed into a person of love and joy and peace. That should raise the horizon of possibility over your life. Christ-likeness is possible. Something approximating transformation is possible in this life, but it is not inevitable. And it is certainly not natural. And the inertia and the digital age in particular and just the glowing rectangle in your front right pocket, that alone, much less the pace of the city and the secular air and ideology swirling in our brain, will likely deform us away from the image of Jesus more than form us into the image of Jesus, which means the need of the hours for a greater level of intentionality in our discipleship or our apprenticeship to Jesus. My friend uh, John Tyson in New York City is a Bonhoeffer kind of amateur scholar, and he tells this great story about this obscure Bonhoeffer story he found in a journal. And I don't even know how true this story is, but it preaches really well. So it's going to be true for the next couple of minutes. I think it's true. It's from a trustworthy source. And the story is, you know, Bonhoeffer, if you know him, right before World War II, 
goes out and founds this intentional community called Finkenwald that's kind of in modern day Poland. It's kind of one half clandestine seminary to kind of hide from the Gestapo and raise up pastors that will resist the ideology of the Third Reich, what they call the confessing church, and stay true to orthodoxy in the face of death and torture and imprisonment, and one half kind of neo-monastic intentional community. They lived by a rule of life. They prayed the Psalms every morning. They did exercise in the middle of the day. They had poetry readings every night. This was like the jam, right? <laughs> and his famous book, Life Together, was written out of his experience in Finkenwald. And, uh, but Bonhoeffer comes from money. He was educated, old Berlin, privileged family. And so the story goes that the family, which were kind of nominal quasi-Christians, send like a family member or like a close family friend out to Finkenwald basically to talk sense in Bonhoeffer and say, you're out of your mind. What are you doing out here? And this is before everything fell apart. This is when Nazi Germany was honestly like the pinnacle of human civilization at the time. We do not think of it that way because we know how the story ends. But at the time, it was really the zenith of Western culture. And so they send him out. What are you doing? You're out of your mind. Come back to Berlin. Come back to your professorship. Come back to your privilege, basically. And the story goes that Bonhoeffer says, come with me. And Finkenwald was on a lake. And they get in this rowboat. And he rows his friend across the lake. And they walk up this rise on the other side. And there's a Nazi air base for the Luftwaffe on the other side. And Hitler youth marching up and down the runway. And the story goes, Bonhoeffer points back at Finkenwald and says, this must be stronger than that. And he points at the Nazi air base and walks back down the hill. And I think the point there is that this, our lifestyle architecture together of discipleship to Jesus in community, must be stronger than that. And it must be stronger than this. It's got to be stronger. And these are the most powerful things basically in the history of humanity. The time for like, I'm going to go to church and try to be a good person and listen to Christian podcasts when I'm in the mood and folding laundry, that world is gone. You can move to Texas or Nashville and get it for 10 more years and you could just <laughs> coast, right? And how many of your friends have already done that? <laughs> They're going to have a great 10 years and then it's coming, right? Or we can put our feet deeply into the ground of where God's called us to be, missionaries to a post-Christian age, and we can form a tiny little city within a city, a tiny little alternative society, our own Finkenwalds in our living rooms, around our dining room tables, at little bistro tables and coffee shops across the city, of loving, intentional people practicing the way of Jesus together as a way of life, making space for God to slowly but surely transform us from the inside out. And that is really the heart. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are in this room because at some point you likely or possibly read a book I wrote a couple of years ago uh, about slowing down or about hurry. And that book was honestly, in my little evil genius attempt to orchestrate whatever, that book was really just a prequel to this one because I really believe that hurry is a non-starter for the spiritual life in general and for any serious life architecture of spiritual formation, apprenticeship to Jesus. It requires subtraction, not addition. It will require you to slow down and simplify your life. You cannot just add the stuff in the book in your lap on top of your ordinary, maxed out, exhausted, constantly on the edge of burnout, digitally distracted, normal Seattle life. It does not work that way. Um, Hulu works that way. Following Jesus does not work that way. And uh, you're not fitting in, you know, the bear season two on top of your job and career and raising kids. You're reorienting your life around apprenticing under Jesus. 24-7, together in community. And, uh, but that, of course, begs the question, if the need is to slow down, we have to ask the question, what are we slowing down for? Because um, you can slow your life down just to really crush it at work. You can slow down your life to work on physical fitness and health and wellness. You can slow down your life to just prioritize your family. You can slow down your life to take up a hobby like bonsai. You can slow down your life for all sorts of things. And in my view, the whole point is to slow down and simplify our life around our formation into the image of Jesus. 
slowly practicing his way together. That's the heart behind the book, and that's why I'm here. I'm so happy that you'd come. Thanks so much. Tyler and I are going to have a bit of a conversation next. Hey, woo, hot. Um, big shout out to CC and the Practicing Way crew just carrying that table through the crowd, you guys. Um, I, exactly, Seattle, come on, you guys. We can do better than that. Um, I am excited to just engage John Mark with a couple questions and then make room for you all to ask questions. But the most like pressing and you know pertinent one was did Jane try the guacamole? She didn't, she just, she tried the queso and not the guacamole? Oh my gosh. Lord forgive her. It's extra, that's right. You can get the queso, but not the guac. I get it. Um, you know, glory to glory. Um, I just, hearing John Mark talk, um, and again, it's a gift to have you back here with us, but one of the questions that I feel like raises and comes up within me is like, you know, the, the discernment process to even realize perhaps how you are or not practicing the way. You know, we talk like all these different ideas of like, these are the things in the way, like hearing you mention a variety of factors that keep us, whether it's, you know, the tech sphere around us and all of its amazing products and things, or it's stuff in our own hearts. Um, but I do think what you were mentioning about we just want to kind of add on practicing the way on top of like our already life, you know, the ways that we operate and practice other ways. And so I don't know if you have um, just kind of any thoughts about how do we even start to discern the state of our hearts or the state of our practices so that we can maybe even see where we're at to try to move into the subtraction or the addition of these things. Yeah, I mean, so a huge chunk of the book is about this ancient Christian paradigm of a rule of life, which uh, you're welcome to read about, <laughs> but it is basically this kind of overall life architecture that makes space in your life for God and for formation into the image of God, into a person of love. And um, rule of life is ancient language. It's not modern language. It's often off-putting to people's kind of modern ears because the word rule, it's rule, singular, not rules, plural. So a rule of life isn't a list of rules. It's this kind of ancient paradigm. But that alone is off-putting for people. So I like to say, and I write this in the book, that whether you've heard the phrase rule of life three seconds ago or been living by one since you were born, you have a rule of life, even if you've never heard that language before, <laughs> never adopted one on purpose, just meaning you likely have, you have a way of life already. You likely have some kind of a morning routine you have, you probably sleep with your phone next to you or in another room. You probably have something you do first thing upon waking. You probably have some kind of a job that has responsibilities. You probably have a budget that has something to do with your interaction with your resources. You probably have activities that you do on a regular basis on the weekend. You probably have some, uh, a set of relationships that make up most of your life. You already have a rule of life. The question's not, do you have one? It's, do you know what it is? Meaning, is it conscious or unconscious? And is it working for you or against you? You know, Willard used to say, your system is perfectly designed to give you the results you are getting, which was like a little saying he got from like the business consultancy world that's usually applied to like widgets, then the bottom line in the Excel spreadsheet. You know, your system is perfectly designed to give you the results you're getting. So if you're coming out of profit loss or whatever, what's your system? Let's go back upstream and fix the system. And he used to apply that to like your spiritual formation. Your system, meaning your life architecture, your way of life, your rule of life, is perfectly designed to give you the results you are getting. So what are the results you are getting? That's one way you can like start at the end and kind of reverse engineer. What's the result you are getting? Is the result, now and there's no perfect results, but are you getting the results of year over year? Let's take the fruit of the spirit in Galatians chapter five. I think, and then you, this has to be 360 review style, 
the people who know me best would say, I am becoming a little bit at a time more loving, more joyful, more peaceful, more patient, more kind and gentle, and on down the list, or not. And if, you know, I, when I first did this exercise, I realized I am becoming more anxious, more frustrated, more impatient, more hurried, in my case, more alienated from God, and not through some, like, colossal sin I was hiding. I think just through sheer exhaustion and busyness and digital distraction. It's like when I would sit down to pray, I could not even be with God in any meaningful way beyond trying to, like, say some words and think some thoughts in his direction. If that's the results you are getting, and hopefully yours are much better than mine, um, then likely something about the system of your life is, is not right. And that's, you know, the whole definition of insanity is, you know, trying to do the same thing. That's how many of us approach it. We're like, all right, so I must just need to, like, go to church a little bit more and listen to some more Christian podcasts and just try harder. How's that working for you? Um, And the reality is information, inspiration, and willpower are incredibly ineffective at any significant change in our life. So we have to get farther back upstream and look at our life. Most of us in urban contexts and professional contexts, contexts like a Seattle or L.A. now or Portland where I was, most, for most of us, that journey begins with rest. Um, not all people. Some people it begins with like getting off their butt and getting activated. Um, but most people I interact with in a context like cultural context like Seattle, the journey begins with just take a Sabbath. Begin to slow down, declutter your life, begin to enter into solitude, begin to interact with scripture in a slow and prayerful way. Like it begins with subtraction, not addition, with rest, not with work, with doing less, not with doing more, uh, with coming home, not with going out. And then you kind of reorient from there. So I think that's what I would say is, again, Jesus is not asking you necessarily to to do something you're not currently doing. He's asking you to do what you're currently doing differently in a way of which the end result is love, joy, peace, patience, take your metric of choice, faith, hope, love, deepening union with God, not the other psycho-spiritual metrics that we're often trending in the wrong direction on. When you think about, um, like, the experience of a context like Portland or Seattle or LA as well and the temptation towards like um, kind of the individualized pursuit of this you know or like the okay I'm going to take the best influencers who are teaching me attachment I'm going to take the best authors that I love and their spiritual formation and I'm going to just kind of try to do this myself like from your own experience or even you know, how you would reframe perhaps to us, what do you see as the role of community in this, you know, instead of, instead of me or you practicing the way, like us practicing the way, or you as the plural, like what would you, what would you speak into that about how this is Oh yeah, I mean, I would just agree wholeheartedly with that. I mean, we can't help but be formed by the culture around us. And the culture around us is You know, Robert Bella, the famous sociologist who coined the term radical individualism, said it's the defining trait of America. I was thinking about de Tocqueville, and I think it was, was it 1835? I'm sure somebody in here is better educated than me. But 1835, you know, writes Democracy in America, that a lot of people have been kind of coming back to that book because it feels eerily prophetic for this moment in our nation. And you just see the seed of so much of what's wrong with our country goes back to the very beginning. And he pointed out, you know, he's, he just marked how marked individualism was in America. This is in the early 1800s. And he said, America, unlike any other nation in the world, including any other nation in Europe, Americans perceive themselves as individuals in a group, not as members of a larger, a part of a whole. And that is so deep in the ethos of America. And so there's a couple of ways that gets that that cultural ethos, that cultural assumption 
really denudes and deracinates our spiritual formation, our discipleship to Jesus. One is we often think of discipleship to Jesus or spiritual formation as like a Christianized version of kind of project self and sex, you know, self-actualization. So it's like, oh yeah, I'm totally into like Sabbath and Lectio Divina and contemplative prayer and essential oils and cold plunging and new sauna. I love the new sauna and microdosing. It's awesome. It just all <laughs> is all together. And I do that and intermittent fasting and, uh, you know, and, it, like, and that's kind of the lens we put it through. And then there's no moral challenge to us. And there's no call to death to self beyond like stuff that Andrew Huberman's all about, you know? <laughs> and he's very helpful actually, but you know. Um, and so it gets deracinated by that. It gets deracinated by the individualism where we go try to do this alone. Uh, again, rule of life, uh, I write this in the book, huge part of what this book is about, what practicing the way the organization, some of our teams here tonight, what we're advocating for and very pragmatically working on. <laughs> But, you know, this tiny micro resurgence and rule of life that uh, this book and our work is a part of is beautiful, but it's all being run through the grid of radical individualism with like Tyler writing his rule of life and I'm writing my rule of life. And what's your name? Andrew, you could write your own rule of life, which, would be, which is great. My contention is you already have a rule of life. So anything that brings greater intentionality and thoughtfulness and discipleship to it is beautiful. I'm all for it. It's a huge step in the right direction. But historically, if you were to say to a monk, you know, what's your rule of life? Or a Christian in the 8th century, what's your rule of life? They would have looked at you so confused, like, St. Benedict's. Or like whatever their monastic order was, whatever their church's rule was. Like they rule of life historically there was no individual rule of life it was always a community document it was like a community constitution it was designed to hold a community together around shared rhythms of spiritual formation i mean the first you know there's way of life there's precursors in the new testament itself some people argue the new testament itself is a rule of life there's the didache that is you know earlier than the book of Revelation and some New Testament books that is really kind of, some people would say the first rule of life. But the first like official codified, that Latin word regular rule of life is used is with St. Augustine in the fourth century in North Africa in Hippo. And when he was asked to become the Bishop of Hippo, he rightly discerned that pastoral leadership is incredibly dangerous to the soul. And he said yes on one stipulation that all of the other pastors and vicars would move onto this premises, this compound they made, and would live together in community and all resist the shadow side and the danger to the soul of pastoral leadership together. And he quickly realized they need some kind of an organizational structure, so he wrote the Rule of St. Augustine that was originally just designed to anchor their community together again and specifically to resist the pull of temptations unique to them as spiritual leaders. That is now, that rule of life is still in existence today, 1,600 years later. In Augustinian monasteries, the Augustinian order still exists in both the Catholic tradition and in the Anglican tradition all around the world. People still following the same rule of life. My point is, it was designed for a community to come together and resist the deformation of their particular context and life call in order to do life together around prayer and shared rhythms of formation to Jesus. That's what a rule of life is. So that doesn't mean that you need to be the next St. Augustine and codify something with bullet points that like 1,600 years people are still following Sally's rule of life or whatever. But it means if at all possible, we got to do this together. And the third thing I would say where our culture really deracinates and deforms us is it confuses spiritual wellness with surrender to Jesus. And that's where often we think the end goal of practices, for example, is just to like feel better and feel happy all the time or be less stressed out and less anxious and kinder. That's all good stuff. But really the end goal is to deepen our surrender or to very, use a very unpopular and very New Testament word, our obedience to Jesus. That's really the goal. There's lots of other people out there doing really good work in the therapeutic and wellness space. And I think we can learn a lot from them because I think we're holistic beings. And I think as a general rule, exhausted, stressed out, unhealthy, mentally unwell people tend not to be the most loving, joyful, and kind people you know. 
So I think there's a lot we can learn about being whole beings from people that don't even name Jesus yet. But one colossal difference is our end goal is not just to like lower our body fat and our blood pressure through hydrotherapy. It's to become the kind of people that naturally obey the teachings of Jesus out of a transformed inner new man and woman and to do that together as we form what Dr. King called a community of the beloved. So good. I um, know that a lot of the people in this room, I'm kind of thinking about, you know, we talked about the individual experience of practicing the way and then the communal and kind of the pitfalls with that. But I know many of you are leaders. And I think um, one of the greatest gifts uh, is, for me, is asking people who I admire or that I'm learning from, like, what are you learning in this season? But even more so, like, I think about how practicing the way, like this lived reality for you, not just this book you've written, but this thing that you've been toiling and, and grappling with in community and in church leadership and, and leadership beyond the church, like how um, maybe the best frame the question is, like how, what would you say to the kind of leaders in the room who are leading church communities about taking the journey themselves and not just kind of being a fine purveyor of rule of life or religious goods and services, like both the learning yourself and the practicing it yourself as you're trying to cultivate it in community. You know, Pete Scazzaro, if you're familiar with his work, and if not, you're welcome, um, <laughs> has that great line for pastors and leaders, and this would be true for parents or leaders of any type, and his line is, you know, you cannot give away what you do not possess, and then his follow-up is, and you cannot help but give away what you do possess. Um, and I love that, meaning there's a, there's a light side of I can't give to you tonight anything that I don't have in my body and my life, but I can't help but accidentally give to you at the same time parts and bits and pieces of my shadow. And if you don't walk away from here tonight after listening to me, you know, there's that beautiful proverb, uh, in the abundance of words, sin is not lacking. My life is living proof of the truth of that wisdom statement in Scripture. And so if you listen to me talk at you for an hour, hour and a half, you're going to walk away with at least a good guess about my shadow side. Or you're quite oblivious and dull. But you're, you look like quite smart people. So I'm sure you, see, you, just been you might have just picked up right there. Oh, he's a little contemptuous and judgmental at times. Yes, I am. Um, so I'm going to do my best to fake it and make myself seem more godly than I really am. Um, but a little bit of the real me is going to slip through, you know. And um, because you cannot help but give away what you do possess. And so that means that, you know, teachers are learners first, pastors are sheep first, leaders are followers first. We have to go on the spiritual journey um, imperfectly with all of our shadow and, and the, the, the challenge to pastoral leadership to writing a book is we don't get the luxury, it's like parenting, you know, there's a conspiracy of grace where nobody's really ready to be a parent until about age 60. <laughs> but your body is designed to become a parent at about 17. And that's a conspiracy of grace. And, um, and in a similar way, we don't get the luxury of going on this 50-year journey to become a saint and then coming back and walking people through. And if we did, we would be so far down the path, we would be no help to my 15-year-old son back there, or no help to me, no help to us, because we would be too far ahead. And so God has orchestrated the community of Jesus in such a way that we are dependent upon grace, both from God and from each other. And we have to forgive. That's why I put central in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. You can't be led by a pastor unless if you're willing to forgive your pastor. And um, because we all stumble along the way. So I think the primary word to pastors is just follow Jesus, go on this journey. And it's incredibly important that you go on this journey um, because we all have this kind of shadow side to our person. We all have unhealed wounds. We all have blind spots. We all have areas where we are in denial about the reality of our story. We have all have areas where we're not integrated. We all have areas where we are driven and motivated 
not by love or by the call of God, but by greed or fear or an attempt to prove our dad wrong or an attempt to get people to love us and validate our, our identity. All of us do. The extraordinary danger for pastors is we can Christianize all of it and we can baptize it in the name of we want to reach more people for Jesus or serve the church or whatever. And we are good with words generally, which means we can be good at manipulating reality. And that is an incredibly dangerous combination. It's why Paul says that judgment for spiritual leaders in 1 Corinthians 3 will judge in the future the intent of the heart. Every time I read that, I'm terrified because I know, I don't know about you, Tyler, but I know after 20 years serving a church, I'm not sure at what point in my heart I was serving the church and the church was serving me and my purposes and my agenda. I just know that at best it was both of those things underneath the surface of my heart. All that to say, if you're not aware of that and in tune with that and actively exploring that and inviting other people into that, then that shadow is going to be unimpinged and it is going to bleed out into the people you serve and lead, whether it's your three-year-old and five-year-old daughters in your family or three and 4,000 people in a megachurch, it's going to bleed out. And so leaders, I think, have a special responsibility before God to go on that inner journey, if you want to call it, and to really be pioneers in opening up their brokenness to God and to other people so that we can be what you know Henry Nouwen called the wounded healer. His beautiful picture of a pastor is not the moral exemplar, it's the wounded healer. And I love that picture. He was that, and I love that, I love that picture. So I think that's the main thing I would say to pastors is do not become inebriated with the seduction of success and outward metrics. And none of that's all vanity in the end. But go on the inner journey and graciously ask that God would allow you to bring other people along the way. You know. It's so great. I think it gives permission that in some ways is really, it's really tempting as a leader to hide in plain sight, you know, or to, and perpetuate the loneliness and to not want to be seen because what might they do, you know, and all the imposter syndrome and those things. So I just really appreciate your honesty and I appreciate um, your willingness to kind of just say, hey, look, like this, the rest won't last. It's going to be burned away. It's going to be, you know, and, and us of unclean lips, you know, Lord, Lord, would you, would you work that out within us? Have mercy. Right? Yeah, I, one last question and then I'll kick it to you guys because I'm just enjoying this too much. So I'll be short this time, I promise. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, make don't give an, us a mic. Make we'll it be an here easy for a while. This is perfect. Um, no, I was, you know, you, going back to the kind of last picture you shared with us, the Bonhoeffer thinking wall, the, you know, this needs to be stronger than that, like that imagery. And I think, like, um, if you're around the church long enough or you're leading within it or you're living within it and you mentioned church wounds and all those things, but what just, um, kind of what vision or sense of revelation do you think maybe God is putting in your heart and in your mind for like, man, what this could be, you know, in this season of head, you know, like what the beauty of the church could look like. And I think a lot of it has to do with some of these things you've shared or are sharing with us. But, you know, when you envision where God is taking us in the season ahead and in mm. the church, maybe in America or in contexts like ours, you know, what, um, what are you believing for or hoping for? What, what kind of comes out uh, as excitement, you know, mm. or what you're imagining God will do that will make this better than that? Oh, <clears throat> well, yeah, I mean, in some ways I'm really hopeful. You know, there's the sad reality of nominal Christianity that has been the norm in America for a long time is burning up. And, and that's sad because, you know, what's replacing it is basically a political war between two different toxic options. And, um, but the good thing is all that surviving in the church space is like really robust, serious discipleship to Jesus that's done in community. Because that's about the only thing that will survive the secular apocalypse. Come on, you can whether, get excited. And see whether that. it's like the dude with the goat hat storming the Capitol apocalypse or the everything outside this window apocalypse, which, yeah. which is, granted, looks a lot nicer, but is, but is still painfully lonely and alienated and alone. 
Um, and so I'm really hopeful that the old models of catering to consumer Christians, um, again, you can, you can rock that train for a little bit longer in Texas, but it's not going to last. And I'm really hopeful for what some of the best churches I know are in some of the most secular, difficult soil in America. They're in L.A. and San Francisco and Portland and New York City and Boston. They're just like thriving churches. And that's really thriving, young, robust, serious, theologically orthodox churches. And that's really encouraging. Um, I think there's a wider appetite. The church is less and less sectarian. And there's a wider and wider appetite for these kinds of conversations. I mean, even this book tour, we were all laughing as a team because each, everybody said he's kind of, there's a host church that's kind enough to open their doors to us. And it's like we were with Southern Baptists one night, then we were with Anglicans, and then I was with, believe it or not, Presbyterians, <laughs> then I was with the head of the vineyard the next night, then we were in Silicon Valley with a non and non. I don't even know what you are other than nice, but. Um, <laughs> And nice. I don't care. That's it. And it was just amazing. Large churches, mid-sized churches. And it was so the palpable, like, longing in the room for this stuff from different people in different parts of the country and different church traditions. I've never seen that in my life. All the stuff that I'm talking about now, normally I would get strong pushback and resistance from pastors on because it's a pretty significant challenge to the status quo of a lot of church models. And now I'm getting the opposite. How do you do this? How would you handle this? This is what we're doing. This is what we're trying. Extraordinary the number of churches I'm hearing that are trying innovative things. So I'm hopeful for that. And at a very pragmatic level, I don't know what the future is, but I think a couple pathways forward are one rule of life. You know, um, the ancient church had not one but two rules. They had the rule of faith and the rule of life. The rule of faith started with the New Testament, was later codified in the creeds, and came through all the way to the Reformation. And the modern church still has a rule of faith. Like, likely your church, if it has a website, uh, you will likely dink around on there and you will find a page. We don't call it a rule of faith anymore. We call it a statement of faith or a doctrinal statement, or normally the page is titled, What We Believe. And you can go on there, and you can click on it, and it will probably have, like, the core doctrines of the Christian worldview. You know, the Trinity of God, the Imago Dei of human beings, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the pre-tribulational rapture, you know, like the core, <laughs> core, core doctrines of the faith. Like, you're in or you're out, you know? Um, no, in jest. Um, but almost no church in the world that I know of has a page next to the What We Believe page that says how we live. We love our enemies. We fight materialism actively through generosity and, and simplicity. We live together. We resist radical individualism by doing weekly meals together. We regularly fast. We live by the pattern of feast and fast and moderation. We practice Sabbath and give a seventh of our life to God as an act of delight and worship and joy together. We, we work against anxiety through the attachment. I've not seen that page. And, um, and the fact that the ancient church had both and the modern church has one tells you a lot about kind of what's transpired in the Western church, what's gone wrong in the Western church and a possible pathway back, not toward utopia, but toward a healthier model of church. So I think church is beginning to reorganize around a rule of life, even if it's really, really simple and beginner level and introductory. Uh, churches as a place where people relearn how to follow Jesus daily. And churches as a place that rather than speed up your life with more Christian busyness to add on top of your already existed life, but rather train you to slow down and almost force you to slow down to be a part of it. I think that's a beautiful pathway forward. And the other pathway forward is I think there's a great moment of moving from stages to tables, moving you know, from monologue to dialogue, from a lot of the work that I do to the work that we do together in our living rooms and in conversations. You know, Much of the Protestant stream of the church, this is not true of the Catholic church, but comes out of the Protestant Reformation, where basically the preaching and teaching of Scripture, Scripture itself was lost. I mean, if you go back, that moment when Luther and the Protestant Reformers are doing their thing, it is a bleak moment in church history. 
And to prove that, not only are they doing their thing, you have Ignatius of Loyola and St. John of the Cross. You have all these like other renewal movements in the Catholic Church at the same time that are basically saying this thing is so corrupt, so complicit with empire, it's hopeless. Most priests had never even read the Bible before, much less people did not even have it in their language. So there was this rediscovery of scripture that literally changed the course of Western history change the course of the world. I mean, so many of the things that we take for granted that we consider good outside the walls of this building are what happened when people rediscovered the Bible in the 16th century and began teaching it and preaching it. But in that model, where most people did not have the Bible in their language, did not have educated, did not have Tim Mackey in the Bible Project in their right ear as they were like cycling to work, you had to go and sit through a sermon at a church service in order to get access to the truth of Scripture. And likely from an educated person that was in the center of the room. And if you wanted to have it be good, you probably had to go to a pretty large church because everybody wanted to hear it if it was especially done well. And the beauty of our moment now, that the need for that will continue. The need for, I have a high view of preaching and teaching, and I love Tim Mackey to death. He's like my patron saint after Willard. But... Um, <laughs> But then that can now be delivered through other mechanisms. And, you know, um, Sundays, for example, large Sunday gatherings are a great delivery mechanism for preaching and teaching. They're a lousy delivery mechanism for community and for practice and for slowing your life down and for meditation. They're not good delivery mechanisms for that. You know what's great for that? Daily prayer, a rule of life eating a meal together in your community, spiritual direction, mentorship, doing life together in the same neighborhood or place, that's really good. And so I think the digital age is probably 90% con, 10% pro. But man, there's, there's a real moment where I think we're able, I mean, to, to, let's just use Bible Project as an example. I mean, I watched two of their videos yesterday with my son. That is an extra, to have that level of scholarship available in a cartoon, <laughs> on your phone in four minutes? That's extraordinary. And that opens up space. And that doesn't mean that local churches shouldn't be doing the work of teaching and preaching and Bible study. But it opened up space for church to become smaller and smaller and more relational and more practice-driven and more incarnational and more and more around tables. So I think you're going to see more and more churches that look like this and smaller and less and less of the mega and the large. Not because they don't serve a vital role, I really think they do, but I think they no longer have to be the dominant model. They can be one piece in an ecosystem of the Church of Jesus. And so I think there's a couple pathways of table, community, rule of life, practice-based discipleship, contemplative spirituality, um, that I'm just really, and a hunger for this stuff because the old stuff isn't working, then I'm really hopeful. I said I would make it short. That was not short. Let's take some questions. Come on. Yes. Before the night is over, we've well, got to be out of here. Come on. It. And to say, like, just like the Bible Project, what Practicing the Way is doing to resource our local churches so that we don't have to make up our own version of it. Yeah. Like, in That's every what we're which way. Oh, my so, goodness. So you can get about gift. the business of actually doing It's amazing. Like, community. you don't have to, you could do the thing and not have to reinvent the thing, you know? And so. So thankful for that. But yes, questions. You got a microphone. Do we got any more microphones? We got one? Okay. Sweet. Or thoughts or Gloria, whatever. Thoughts, yeah. Uh, please stand too and say your name and then share. But remember, we want more questions. So say just a few things if you're going to say something. Hey, uh, Jared. Um, I noticed two things in, in your book. Um, one, I, I heard you changed the font. And the second, <laughs> the... Uh, the tone or voice seemed uh, more mature, and that, I don't mean that a criticism of other books, but it had a different tone to it than your previous books. Was either of those two things in, intentional? I mean, I'm just getting older. You're so much more mature now. And I may have had 20-20 vision my whole life, and I may be in the process of getting a, an appointment with an eye doctor because I'm struggling to read at night before bed. Um, uh, yeah, there's, I don't have a great backstory. I really wanted to go with the serif. We've gone sans serif for far too long. <laughs> and the time has come to mature beyond Helvetica to the next step. And so well serif, done. we went for it. And uh, it's interesting, the mature tone. <laughs> no, I mean, I, don't, I mean, you develop as a person. And 
um, I am intentionally trying to get less stupid with each passing year. <laughs> and I don't know if it's working or not, um, but maybe I'm fooling you is what you're saying. I don't know. If it, I mean, you're always trying to ride at that edge of helpful and accessible, um, yet I, I want it to feel interesting and like you're learning something, not just being reminded of something, you know. So I don't know. I don't have much to say, but I'm glad you noticed. <laughs> And I'm glad you think I'm more mature. I fooled you well. Thank you. Uh, how, do you say say your name? <laughs> I'm Andrew. That would be wonderful. <laughs> We've been over it. Thank, thank I'm you, Andrew. Andrew. Uh, my question is... Uh, I like your Bible, by the way. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I, in podcast with Mark Sayers, I've heard him talk about the um, disconnect that older generations have with the importance of things like practicing the way or biblical literacy, discipleship, so on and so forth. And that it's not impacting things like my generation or millennials. Do you have any like words of wisdom in how we can invite older generations into think the importance and the discussions of things like that? Um, whether it's leading within a multi-generational church as well as in relationship with my own parents. Boomers, am I right? <laughs> I think you meant like old, old people. Oh, old, old. But yes, you know. Um, Sorry, boomers. Sorry. You know, it's hard to answer that because I think that's a relational question more than a spiritual question, even not, not that those are separate categories, but that's a relational skill question. And, um, you know, they came of age at a very different moment you know, and uh, they came at age in the peak of cultural Christendom. You know, so Rodney Stark, his book, Churching of America, basically had argued that peak Christendom in America was not at its founding. So most people today think America used to be really, really Christian, and over the years it's just gotten less and less so. And then that creates all sorts of problems when you think about like the racial history of our nation and, you know, gender equality. But he would argue that the most post Christian America ever was was at its founding. So he does all the sociological days, a dry, academic, boring book. You would not enjoy it. Um, but argues that the most secular America ever was, was at its founding, and more secular than it is today. And that the most secular part of the country was the South. And the most Christianized part of the country was the Northeast, which is bizarre. If you think about all the Anabaptists, all the super serious Christians, the Quakers who were marching against you know, slavery and were not, we refused to put sugar in their tea or wear cotton. They were all up in the Northeast, Pennsylvania, Maine, and the South was basically the most secularized parts of the country, which is where slavery flourished. It actually starts to make sense of things. All that to say, he argues that 1962 was peak Christendom in the United States of America. It was actually after World War II. It wasn't until the Third Great Awakening, he argues, that America even became a Christian nation, and it didn't reach the, the height of its swell until well after World War II in the early late 50s, early 60s. So if you're an older generation and you grew up in that moment, you grew up in a moment where the cultural assumptions were just very Christianized at some level. You know, my dad, who uh, came to faith in 1971 at a Billy Graham crusade, that is, he was playing in a rock band in Northern California in the Bay Area, what we now call Silicon Valley, nobody called it then. His girlfriend invited him to go to a Billy Graham crusade, and he had nothing, he was no, not interested in Jesus, he just wanted to hook back up with his ex-girlfriend, and, and who's, who awkwardly is not my mom, so I'm sorry, <laughs> this story does not end that way. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he tells stories about growing up in what we would now call Silicon Valley, and, I mean, right in the thick of it, Santa Clara. And you know how everything was closed on Sunday. He tells me, I remember, he told me multiple times about when 7-Eleven, my dad's not that old, he's 73. When 7-Eleven first came to town, it was the first time anything was open on a Sunday. He remembers going in and buying like a candy bar on a Sunday, and it was just shocking. And I looked it up, that was in like 1969 or something crazy. And he said on Sundays, everybody went to church. You were either Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, or if you weren't a Christian, you went to a mainline church. And he wasn't a Christian, so he went to a mainline church. And then most families all had Sunday dinner right afterwards and spent the afternoon together. Can you imagine yeah. that in Silicon Valley today? I mean, that world is gone. I mean, I can't even fathom that world. But that's the world my dad grew up in, and he's not even that old. So in that world, there's just such a different set of assumptions. And in that kind of a vague 
Christian, you know, cultural, it's always a mix of culture and paganism or, or Christianity and secularism. You could just make all of these assumptions and kind of preach Romans into it and call people to go follow Jesus, and there are all these assumptions. So that world is gone. So I think we just need to be really gracious with people um, because they're living in a different world than the one they spent their whole life in, and that provokes anxiety and defense mechanisms that come up. So often what we see is you know, spiritual hardness of heart or arrogance. Sometimes it's just anxiety and coping mechanisms. So if you could just be really gracious and patient and, and not assume that we know better, just we might know our culture better. They might know actually how to follow Jesus a lot better. And then all that to say, the one piece of relational advice I found really helpful is whenever possible, avoid emotionally loaded words and terminology and try to be like a missionary and translate these ideas into the language of their vernacular. So I remember my seminary professor saying to me once, you know, Never have a conversation, if you know this insider language, about egalitarianism versus complementarianism. Those words are so emotionally loaded, they instantly put people into their limbic system and make people wildly irrational and incapable of having a thoughtful, nuanced conversation about God's intentions for human flourishing. So you have to find, you just have to sneak around those words and and say the same thing that you believe or raise the question that you want to raise, but without using the emotionally loaded landmine language and terminology. And I think, man, there's a lot of wisdom in there. There's wisdom of that talking about racial justice in our nation. There's wisdom talking about theological positions like the role of women or men or whatever. There's wisdom in talking about spiritual formations. So probably don't say to the 80-year-old, you need to be practicing contemplative prayer and like Christian mysticism because, you know, most of us are like, yeah, that sounds rad. Let's do that with microdosing. It sounds great. <laughs> and they're probably like, you know, oh, that's bad. That's evil. So I just think being a missionary, meeting people where they're at, that's a form of love, you know. Hi, I'm Samantha, um, and I work at a church, and so I have a, like, my Sabbath is on Friday, um, and I find it really difficult because, like, all the people in, in leadership also at my church have families and are married, and I'm single, and so um, I'm kind of practicing Sabbath on my own, um, and so I was just wondering if you have any tips for... Um, practicing Sabbath, um, hopefully in community, but it can be really hard when other people are working or have other things to do with their families. So like midweek Sabbath tips. Oh, that's a lovely question. I think the main thing I would just encourage you with is, you know, it took us a long time to figure that one out. Not that we have it nailed, but for it to really move through discipline to delight. And some of these practices begin as you're trying to discipline yourself to do the right thing. And the hope is that you move through that and it just becomes, like Sabbath does not feel like a discipline in my life anymore. It feels like my, my discipline is going back to work afterwards, you know, because I just want my whole life to be Sabbath, you know. It's so the highlight of my week, you know, nine times out of ten. But that took us so many years. My wife was not remotely on the same page at first. And... You know, now we got kids that are teenagers. We're sorting that at stage out. And we've, we've done it all the way through when they were babies, when they were toddlers, and just we're just walking disasters, but joyful and delightful. And now they're teenagers and walking disasters in a different way, you know? No, they're lovely. Um, but my point there is it took us a long time. I would just be really patient with yourself. Try not to judge your experience. It's so hard. We're so used to quick, instant results. And we're so used to, like, if this doesn't please me and give me the kickback I want. And it's like, what is watching, you know, I think about Netflix. Like, I never make it more than 10 minutes into some movie before I'm like, life is too short to watch this. <laughs> you know, turn it off, go to the next thing. How is that forming me? Like, if something's not instantly pleasing me and meeting my consumeristic desires, I'm just going to cut it off and try something else. And we can't help, we're so formed by that culture, we can't help but bring that in. Ah, I tried Sabbath a couple times, it's really hard, I didn't like it, I'm single, eh, I'll just do whatever. And we go back to our regular life. And so I would just encourage you, just don't judge it, be patient, let it be what it is. 
it can be a really good learning period for you because we have to remember that the spiritual disciplines are ultimately designed to free us from our ego, not to imprison us to it. And if we only do them because they give us an emotional or spiritual kickback, then often we can just be deepening our narcissism. So the only true motivation for any of the disciplines is love for God. And so they're supposed to free us from our prison of control and a controlling spirit. And they can just be, God, I just give this to you. Well, whatever you do with it, maybe this will be the best day in my week. Maybe it'll be the most difficult. Either way, I'm giving it to you, and I'm just creating the space for you. That doesn't mean that you don't problem solve and every week try to make it better and pleasure stack and try to figure out how to make it the best day of your week and try to rally other people with you. I'm just saying be patient. Don't judge the process. You're very right. The key is to do it in community and try to bring other people along. That's why we're creating practices and resources and why we're trying to help people in your situation figure it out and press forward. Um, and so, so do it. Form a community the best you can. Find some other people. And then you ha all have to do the work of contextual, just like I right now, I'm having to figure out how to do Sabbath with an 18-year-old hardcore extrovert who never wants to be at home and wants to go out and party 24-7. I'm trying to figure out how to do that. And there's no books on that, it turns out. All the books I know on Sabbath that are awesome are written by introverted empty nesters. And I'm like, okay, that was really helpful, Abraham Joshua Heschel, uh, but how do I do this with my son Jude, you know? And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do the work of translation. And it's, it's experimental, and you're learning. You're trying to figure out as you go. So how do you do this as a single person working at your church with your relational circle? Nobody else in the world is living that particular life. And maybe you can find some other people in similar lives, and you can learn from each other. But that's the real work of creative adaptation that keeps our discipleship not following a formula, but following a living rabbi. And that's the really important work that you're doing. Also, just thank you for sharing that, because I think you open a lot of our eyes to those of us who maybe aren't in your season of life, to the responsibility we have to be church, to those who aren't in our season of life, you know, and, and those who maybe incidentally get marginalized by the experience of how much we have to tend to our families and kids and all of that. And so I just appreciate you sharing. So Tyler would love to invite you to yeah, Sabbath dinner over. at his house Friday night. I, don't, I even have to do that first. I'm the extroverted 18 year old. So <laughs> <laughs> He's coming to your house. Then. I'm coming to your house. Let's party. <laughs> Hi. Um, Tonight has me thinking about a, an intentional family rule of life, because you're absolutely true that we have a rule of life, whether we're you know, intentional about it or not. So do you have any words of wisdom? We have a 14-year-old and a 10-year-old, and this is kind of the air that we have been breathing for a while, but how can we kind of bring them into the conversation so they have a voice in what our rule looks like as a family? Hmm. I always hesitate on the parenting kind of questions because I just feel painfully in touch with my inadequacies as a dad in this, in this season of my life. Um, so I, I don't have some killer answer for you. I just, you know, some of my rambling thoughts would be, um, I think emphasizing relational practices over more disciplined kind of practices will get you a lot of traction. So for example, uh, Sabbath for us, we've had great success with our kids, and we've done it since they were babies. So, you know, I've talked to some people that are trying to now implement Sabbath and digital boundaries with like 16 year olds, and it's way, way harder, right? I don't think it's impossible, but it's harder. Um, where our kids have grown up in it, but we've had really good success. They love it. They, they, don't, they don't dread it. They don't, you know, they love it um, for the most part. And though we've had to loosen the boundaries and the rules around it as they've gotten older, they love it. And I think part of it's because it's a relational, it's a party. It's like some of their favorite people come over and we have ice cream and we, you know, sit around the fire pit and we do all these fun, quirky rituals and it's a deeply relational process. You know, Barna um, did the largest survey of kind of millennial spirituality to date, 26 countries, and they specifically looked at why, you know, most millennials that grew up in evangelicalism are not Christians anymore, or not serious Christians anymore. Very small number, something like 8 to 10% are still serious Christians. 
And no, I don't mean like Francis Chan serious Christians. I just mean like <laughs> basic Christians, you know? Um, and they looked at, you know, what are the common denominators in kids that grew up in these homes that, that continued to follow Jesus in a meaningful way in adulthood? And some of it, most of it was just like real intuitive stuff that you would like kind of guess, you know, like mom and dad weren't hypocrites and stuff like that. They weren't, their youth pastor didn't have an affair with their mom or, you know, it's just kind of <laughs> stuff like that. But the one that to me, I would not have guessed their number one correlation between growing up in the church and following Jesus long term is my read of their data. And I think I'm right. Their number one correlation was whether or not the kids had multi-generational friendships with other serious Christians outside their nuclear family unit. And so I was, you know, I don't know when that study came out, 2016, 18, and it was early enough that I was able to like make a couple corrections in our family. We instantly invited this like older couple into our home community who are awesome and amazing and not cool and so wonderful because I wanted my kids around somebody in their 70s that's following Jesus, you know? And we instantly brought a couple 20-somethings in. Because, you know, if you're a teenager, a 23-year-old is like a demigod. You know what I mean? They're just like, oh, you know? And so having that in there, and um, even though if I wasn't getting like, hey, these are the people I'm going to do confession of sin with, and really we're at the same stage of life, it was like such a joyful gift for my family. So having that kind of multi-generational communal approach. So... I think communal disciplines like church, like Sabbath, like a weekly meal in community, we've had great, I don't know if luck's the right word, but great success in a biblical sense of that word with that. And then I think um, as a general rule, this is maybe I'm betraying my very, very light political leanings too, I think rules work better in the negative than in the positive. So I think that's why morality is commanded in the New Testament and the spiritual disciplines are never commanded, they're only invited. So I think rules can put a boundary on the flesh and can protect our kids from the powerful forces outside that want to deform them. But I think their actual decision to follow after Jesus has to be self-generated. It does not work. So I would not like have a rule of life where I make my kids do contemplative prayer. You know, every morning for 30 minutes, you're going to, like, say the Jesus prayer. Go right now, you know. I don't think that, I think that would be counterproductive. But I will. I mean, we're, we're pretty serious. So, like, in our home, you will, you will not have, there's no devices in your rooms. You do not have, and there's nobody has phones until 16. And then it's a flip phone until 18 years old. And social media, we basically say to kids, you can't have it while you're under our roof. We think it's basically the great Satan, and we encourage you to never have it unless if you have to have it for your work. And if you're going to, then the last summer before you leave for college, we'll help you give a three-month crash course to how to not let this destroy your life. Um, and we'll do our best with you. But it's not happening while you're under our roof. And we just said that from a very, very young age. And, you know, and it's hard. Lots of hard conversations, but really, really good. And I man, if there's anything I do, I have so many regrets as a parent, that is not one of them. That is like no regrets there at all, not in the least bit. And um, so all that to say, I think rules like that, like, hey, we're going to turn our phone off for 24 hours each week, and that phone's going to be a flip phone <laughs> until you're 18. Like those kind of rules, I think, can protect our children until they have a little bit more breathing room to let their character grow up to where it can possibly resist some of this stuff. But the more positive them seeking God, I could be totally wrong. I want to more live that by example, pray the heck out of the kids, create a racial, relational space where other people that they look up to and enjoy are doing that, and then just pray that they follow that path. Because I know I, I, can't, I can't mandate that in the life of my kids, you know? So I don't know if that's helpful, but those are my thoughts. I was going to ask a parenting question, but that you just answered it. So oh, hey, thank boo. you. That's my wife, by the way. I like your kids. Your family seems pretty great. I think we should be asking you that question. You know, mine's not even listening to me. He's uh, I don't even know where. Last I saw, there were headphones on. I don't know. Hi, I'm Carly. Um, hi, Carly. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask, you You mentioned it in your book, um, you give some examples of going to the digital age conversation. Um, you give some practical examples of 
what you've done with technology and boundaries you've placed. So I was just wondering if maybe you have a favorite one or one you've seen most effective um, that you've put into place and then kind of a follow-up, which y'all have somewhat touched on, but any encouragement you have in kind of the fight against the digital age right now? Oh, yeah, awesome. I love that. Oh, yeah, I mean, not, nothing rocket, you know, nothing brilliant to share. Um, does any, did anybody just do Jan, dry January? Any dry January people? Four of us. Minus three, you almost made it. We'll pray for you after. That's great. No. Um, okay, so not a big dry, dry January crowd. More of a Swedish alcoholic crowd in Seattle. Welcome. Welcome. Great Welcome. to, great to, it's the freeze. Um, freeze so, glass. no. Uh, you know, I just, I just, I try to take at least a month off. It's depressing uh, here. <laughs> How do you get through winter? Vodka. Uh, <laughs> no, um, I just finished dry January. I try to take a, at least a month, ideally two off each year from, from any moderate drinking. And uh, before I was listening to this podcast and it, you know, there was this, some nerdy Andrew Huberman study that showed <laughs> that if you take a month off drinking, six months later, you are consistently drinking less on a weekly basis than you were before. And I think, you know, there's something about the human nervous system, the human soul that's wired where abstinence um, affects our capacity to keep things in healthy moderation. And I think something like that's true with the phone. And so, um, you know, Andy Crouch's rule of an, a phone free, an hour a day, a day a week, a week a year, I think something like that. So that's part of his digital rule of life. And, and by the way, a week a year, he means like he goes a week a year with zero devices, no TV, no text messages, no getting to the restaurant on your maps phone, like, well, you do it on vacation or whatever where you can get lost and it's okay. Um, no email, I mean, nothing for a week a year. So we're really, you know, particular about a 24-hour, there's lots of doctors now that are prescribing a 24-hour digital fast to people for the central nervous system. Your brain should just be off all screens for 20, this is like doctors, not people trying to make you more like Jesus, just trying to like help your nervous system. So um, I think some of those disciplines are really helpful. So some of the ones I love are a 24-hour digital Sabbath. The one I love is, I think I got this from Andy as well, uh, parenting your phone. Um, just anybody that has young kids, you know, like most healthy parents that have little kids, you put your kids to bed before you go to bed and maybe have some time to like breathe and be an alcoholic or whatever you do in that, no, I'm just kidding, in that time afterwards. And hopefully your kids get up after you get up, you know. The, I'm, I'm a little older now, so my, the first, you know, uh, digit my kids ever learned was the number seven, because we put an alarm clock next to their bed and said, you cannot get out of bed until it has says seven. Here's a stack of books and Legos, you're here till seven, which at least gave us that time for morning prayer and exercise or whatever. And now they have these cool new lights apparently that like glow and they like go to a green color and like that's the coolest part where was that in and when you were born that was amazing um, so I think that rule of you know putting your phone away in another room I think one of the worst common habits that is so small that I think is doing so much damage is people sleeping next to their phones and then looking at it first thing upon awakening uh, I'm not a neuroscientist. I know just enough to be dangerous, but a lot of the neurogenesis literature would say that uh, the last thing you think about before bed and the first thing you think about upon awakening have a disproportionate impact on the development of your neural pathways. I did this like crazy 21 day solitude retreat out here in Puget Sound. It was so gnarly, it was so hard. And uh, it was basically a guided soldier, nothing, no phone, no devices, no eating out, you cooked all your own food, like 21 days. Your one human contact was five mornings a week. There was like an hour and a half of depth therapy with a clinical psychologist, which is kind of like therapy, but without the happy feelings at the end. <laughs> and, um, but it was at 5.30 every morning. And I asked him, I'm like, why, why is this at five? And it was in December <laughs> here. And I'm like, why is this at 5.30 in the morning? And he's like, oh, because your subconscious is more open to change first thing in the morning. And so th there is something about that moment, uh, whether you get up at 5.30 or later, um, that's, that's deeply more malleable. And so when you wake and the first thing you see is all the bad things happening around the world that day through the news or 
what Elon Musk is saying on X today, or what the current outrage is, or what you forgot for your work, or what the alert is, or what you know, lustful show is streaming on Hulu now. Like if that's when that's the first thing you see, what's that doing to your mind? And when the last thing you see at night is basically dirty TV, what's that doing to your mind? So I think some kind of real healthy boundaries around evening and morning and trying to turn those times not just into healthy practices to soothe your nervous system, like take a bath with Epsom salts or whatever, that's, that's beautiful, but really trying to give least moments of that ending and beginning of the day to God and worship and some kind of loving attention, whether it's serious prayer or just a quiet moment. I mean, I think that is one of the simplest and most transformative and very doable and easy steps. It's so easy to put your phone in another room, go to amazon.com, you guys love it up here, buy, a, buy an alarm clock for 19 bucks and like read a psalm first thing upon waking and then go do your, th like that is so doable. That is so within the realm of pragmatic doability, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say real quick, um, yeah, that Moses, hey bro, you got that piece of art up there? Yeah, do you want to bring it down? Bring it down, buddy. <laughs> so we need to know who came from the farthest to be here tonight. So if you think that's you, where'd you come from? Toronto, Canada. Toronto, Canada. Whoa, you just won Let's in two seconds. Go. Wait, wait, like you're from there originally or you came? Wow, yay. Where, wait, you, you're going to beat Toronto? Wyoming. Is Wyoming? Wyoming? I don't know. I, don't I, I think Toronto's farther. I think Toronto's got it, yeah. This is Moses, by the way, and he's an amazing artist. So here you have Bryce Pengrath. I want this book. That's amazing. All right, so here you go. Done. Awesome. You're welcome. Thank you so much for coming all the way from Canada, another country. It's amazing. Thank you. Bless you. To um, close our time, a uh, couple quick things before you go. One, there are books, again, for sale over there for your friends and Without family. Without pictures of Jesus. Without pictures of Jesus in the back, unfortunately. Unless he, like, shows up in some sort of amazing way while you're reading and <laughs> you have a vision of him, that might work. Um, also, just huge, huge gratitude for you being here and, um, you know, taking this time. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to be praying as a community that, that what was been said is really lived and man, you know, made uh, present in your life, the things that you learned, that it will be sealed by the Holy Spirit and, and transform your communities. Um, last couple things beyond that, I do know that there's an event coming in at 8, right? So I, I know there's a likelihood that some of you are going to want to stay and have questions for John Mark or connect with John Mark for a second. Uh, but be mindful of we got to get folks out and so that we can make room for the folks who are coming in for the 8 p.m. But with all of that, I think I covered everything. If I'm forgetting something, yes, sorry one about thing. that. Can I just say, can we say thank you so much to Tyler oh, and yeah. Seattle Church? And I'm so grateful. I know you are the extroverted party type, but I also know how exhausting it is to run and serve a local church. And this is one more thing on top of just an already punishing workload. So yeah. to you and your staff and the yeah, volunteers please. that are here tonight, Thank you so very much. We are so yeah. grateful. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah. Thank you, team. Um, you guys, give a warm uh, would you, hand. Would you, would you, you bless us? Would I want to bless you. I do. Yes. yes. Holy Spirit. Thank you. That's what I was Come thinking. Yeah, Trying to on. help you pastor, Thank bro. you, Jesus. What, what, what am like, I doing? Yeah. <laughs> um, Lord Jesus, thank you for what you have done in our time together. And I just pray um, and bless everybody in this room. Father, that, that you would keep them, that you would make your face shine upon them, that you would give them peace um, as they practice the way of Jesus and as they walk into all that you have for them in this night as they go home and just reflect on what you've said, but also as they walk it out in their life together, in their families, in their marriages, in their communities, and in their churches. Lord, bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being here. Thanks, everybody. everybody. Thanks for coming. Good night.